Good evening, church. Please be seated. It is good to be in worship with you this night as we celebrate the birth of our King, the Christ child who comes to live among us this night. We welcome all of you who are here tonight at Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church. There are pew pads at the end. Please fill out the friendship pads, pass them down, and then pass them back so you can see who you're worshiping with tonight. We are also glad to welcome all of you who are joining us by live stream. Welcome to Hennepin Avenue Christmas Eve service. We're glad that you're here. A few announcements and that they are in their bulletin about Jim Wallace is coming to um, talk about racism on January 13th and the 12th and 13th and we hope that you'll come and join us for that event and that worship service just around the corner in January. I want to let you know that parking is always free at Hennepin when you come on Sunday mornings, when you come on Christmas Eve. If you did not receive a voucher from your usher, you can get them as you leave tonight. This is, says $5 on there, but that's what we pay. You get to park for free, and that's true every single Sunday at Walker Ramp. So if you have trouble getting parking, make sure you come and stay at, parking, uh, park at Walker Ramp for free. Let us rise now and greet one another and pass the peace. This evening culminates a season of watching and waiting, seeking and listening for the glad news of God's love in Christ. Our Advent candles remind us of this listening, seeing, learning, and praying. Let us pray together. Loving God, the light of the world, thank you for the gift of this night and the gift of your Son, Jesus, coming into our world to bring hope and life. Grace and peace to all. May your glory fill our hearts now and forevermore.
The first scripture reading this evening comes from Isaiah 9, 2, 6, and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth, Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn.
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger.
No. No, we don't have any rooms left. I'll call around town, but I don't think there are any rooms at the America Inn, the Country Inn, or Holiday Inn because there's a big Star Trek convention going on downtown and all the rooms are filled for miles, the desk clerk said. Our hearts sank. Why hadn't I made reservations ahead of time? What was I thinking? My husband, Lindy, and I were traveling all the way down to North Carolina with our three little kids in a minivan to see his brother and his family. And we didn't know how exactly how it would go with little kids. They were really young. You never really know how many stops you're going to have to make along the way, if you know what I mean. So we thought we'd drive as fast as we could and far as we could, and then we'd trust our luck at getting a room. And guess what? Our luck was running out. We hadn't counted on the Star Trek convention. Who knew? Yes, I know. Pastor Nate would have known. <laughs> but we didn't know, and now our minivan seemed to be going more and becoming more mini by the minute. We were bone tired with the kids getting crankier with each mile and we headed down the interstate. For miles and miles we strained our eyes and our necks. We were peering into the darkness looking for any sign of a motel. Even a seedy motel would do at this point. But there was not one inn. Not one. Finally we pulled off at a rest stop because we just couldn't keep our eyes open any longer. You know that feeling, don't you? We decided our only option was to sleep right there in our minivan. Have you ever tried to sleep in a minivan with three kids under the age of 10 who are tired, bored, hungry, confused, and cramped? Have you ever tried to sleep in a minivan with orange parking lots filling both the sky and your van so that it seems almost like day? Have you ever tried to sleep in a minivan, drifting off to sleep, knowing full well that creepy people can and probably will walk by at any moment, peering in your windows to watch you and your little darlings as in your fitful sleep? I have. Oh, oh, holy night. <laughs> Not so much. And it wasn't a silent night either. Nobody likes being left out in the cold. Nobody wants to be told there's no room in the inn. Nobody wants to be turned away as if they're not wanted or needed. Thomas Eyre Jr., a Christian writer, reminds us that many years ago Flannery O'Connor wrote a short story called The Displaced Person. It's about a woman, you may remember it. It's about a woman named Mrs. McIntyre who had inherited a rundown farm somewhere in the rural south many years ago. Mrs. McIntyre had a few African-American workers and Mr. and Mrs. Shortley were a couple that worked for her who managed the farm. Mr. Gusak was a displaced person. He was a war refugee from Poland. And Mr. Gusak knew his way around a farm. He could fix anything. He could grow anything. And he worked like a machine. Doesn't know the first thing about American racism. He crosses the line every day by treating everyone the same. And even though Mr. Guzak is the best help she ever had, Mrs. McIntyre determines that she must get rid of him. She has no other choice, she says. She knows he has nowhere else to go. He is a war refugee. But she says, it's not my responsibility that Mr. Guzak has nowhere to go. I don't find myself responsible for all the extra people in the world. It's a tragedy, she admits. Well, what can she do? She's not responsible. Later, Mrs. McIntyre was talking to her priest. The priest was suggesting that the Christian faith shaped her relationship with her neighbors. And she said with a great harumph, Father Fletcher, as far as I'm concerned, Christ will just have, is just another displaced person. I'm going to have to let that man go, she said. I don't have any obligation to him. And the way Flannery O'Connor writes the story, when she says, I'm going to let that man go, you can't really tell if she means Mr. Guzak or Jesus. But the truth is, it really doesn't matter. Because if she lets either one of them go, she lets them both go. 
I'm not responsible for all the extra people in the world, she says. I love Christmas because it's a time for families to come far and wide to celebrate the love that binds us together. Our son Brian came home this week from Kansas City. We don't see him very often. We talk to him often, but we don't see his lovely face. And we love it when he comes home because our family seems complete. All the places around the table are filled. I wonder, what do you like about Christmas? What do you love about Christmas? I love making Swedish Christmas cookies with my kids. I love the smell of our freshly cut Christmas tree. I love hearing our choir sing choruses from Handel's Messiah. I love seeing your faces glow with candlelight as we sing Silent Night together. I love watching the littlest children sing away in the manger at our four o'clock service. Man, they're cute. All cleaned up and angelic, they sing those words with such a simple, pure love. And I wonder, I wonder, how could Mrs. McIntyre turn her back on any of those little kids? And how could we, how could we really say, we just have to let them go? There's no place for you in the inn. As we come to the end of 2018, there are a lot of so-called extra people moving around the world. Thousands and thousands of them moving from country to country. And sadly, the refrain in many countries is, there's no room for them here. And like Mrs. McIntyre, there are many people today who say, I'm not responsible for all the extra people in the world. Have you ever felt like an extra person? Really, most of us have felt like that extra person in one time or another. Maybe it was when someone you thought was a very good friend ignored you when you needed them the most. Or maybe it was when you got passed over for the job promotion. Or worse yet, you were let go because your job was simply phased out. We have to cut your position. Which may be true, but what we hear is, there's no room for you here. Maybe you felt like an extra when no one invited you to sit at their table during lunch at school. Or perhaps it was when you were newly divorced and your friends stopped calling. Or maybe it was when your loved one died, leaving you feeling all alone. People who are getting older, not me of course, tell me that sometimes they feel invisible and they feel left behind in the world as it changes so quickly. We've all had those moments in our lives when we have felt discarded, disregarded, and marginalized. At one time or another, we've all been there. We all know what it feels like to travel for miles looking and searching for someone who will say, come on in, come on in. There are immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers who are told that they are the extra people. But there are other folks right here in the U.S. who have discovered that they too are the extra people when it comes to affordable health care. They've been told there's no room for you. There are people who search and search for a place to live over and over again, knocking on doors, relying on websites. They are the extra people because there just aren't enough affordable housing options in our city of Minneapolis. There are the extra people who move from shelter to shelter to come to Hennepin for a meal and then move out to live under the tents again in the encampments in our city. They ride the metro transit trains all night long just to keep warm. And sadly, there are extra people who are told in so many ways that there is no room for them in the end, no room for them in our churches or any other place because of their skin color, their gender, their religion, their sexual orientation, or their nationality. But tonight we hear again the story of Jesus' birth. He was born in a stable, laid in a smelly manger because there was no place for him in the inn. We hear that he was born of Mary, an unwed teenage mother from the other side of the tracks in a two-bit town called Bethlehem. And she had no money, she had no status, she had no reputation. And as she and Joseph came into Bethlehem, people may well have stared and thought, I don't have any responsibility for them. They don't live around here. 
The shepherds who heard the songs of the angels and left their flocks hurrying to find the baby wrapped in cloths, they too were the extras because shepherding was one of the lowliest professions, if you could even call it that. Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Do you know what I know? God, the creator of all things, who could have come as a great king, shows up instead as a tiny little baby, helpless and homeless. An extra who came first to other extras, people to whom others were eager to say, there's no place, there's no room for you here. We love a rag-to-riches story, don't we? But Jesus' life never follows that storyline. According to all of the Gospels, he became a penniless rabbi who traveled around from town to town with no home to call his own, a teacher and a savior who would be despised and rejected. And he died that way, too. And so when you find yourself feeling left out, shut out, discarded, and disregarded, you and I are not alone. He knows just how you feel. But listen, do you hear what I hear? John's gospel says he was the word of God made flesh and he dwelt among us. And in him, we have been given the power to become children of God. Which means that in God's eyes, no one is left up. There are no extras in God's family. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus never treated people like they were extras. He welcomed strangers, he embraced lepers, he healed the sick, and he fed the hungry, showing us that every single person matters to God. And that's why I suppose Jesus said, what you do to the least of them, all of the extras, you do it to me. Do you suppose that, G- that God says, my family isn't complete until all of the extras have a place around my table? Jesus said, love them like I do. Love one another. Teach other people to love too, and I will be with you always. The story of Jesus' birth is where it all begins for us. The story never ends because his story continues in us. His calling, his calling to reach out to those who are treated like extra people, that's our calling too. We are called to welcome strangers into our lives, into the church, and into our hearts. Because it is God's intention that not one of God's children should ever be left behind. So for all of you who may feel like the extra person tonight, for all and any of you who have ever been excluded, rejected, and turned away, for anyone whose heart has been broken, there is good news on this Christmas Eve. For on this day, on this day, is born to you and to me a Savior. A Savior who loves you. A Savior who sees you. A Savior who hears you, who knows you and makes room for you. Unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let all God's people rejoice. In just a few moments... Our ushers will receive our Christmas offering. Our Christmas offering is a birthday gift for Jesus, for it is his birthday, not ours. At Hennepin, we take a special offering at Christmas so that we can fund our outreach ministries. Every year, over 700 people go through the Dignity Center, and they are experience dignity perhaps for the first time in their lives as they come to make a plan for a sustainable life, moving from living under bridges to living in transitional housing and then moving on to permanent housing. Our Dignity Center has now just added resources for the VA, for mental health. We have added chaplaincy. We have added all the things that people need to know that they are not extras. We have community meals and we literally serve thousands of people a year. 
your Christmas offering, the gift to Jesus, will help us to feed literally thousands of people every year. We've expanded our feeding ministry to Sunday morning brunch, and if you need a hot meal, 10 o'clock is worship, and we have Sunday brunch every single Sunday of the year now. We sit down together and we eat together because this is God's table. And we have bacon. <laughs> the offering tonight will also go to feed children and buy Wallace Sierra Leone. We are building a school there. We are sponsoring a two-story secondary school, but we're also feeding 900 primary children every single day. Your offering tonight will make sure that little children in Sierra Leone will have at least one meal every day. We hope that you'll give generously because Jesus will be so pleased. We will fund our emergency rental assistance and keep people from becoming homeless in Minneapolis. These are just some of the ways, a few of the ways that we will serve together to make sure everyone knows that they are loved by God. Take a look. Friends, the greatest thing we can do is make the love of Jesus Christ become real in the world. Let us do that together tonight as we offer our gift back to the one who gave himself for us and to us on this holy night. The greatest gift of all is Jesus. Our ushers will move among us now to receive our evening offering.
Loving God, this is indeed Christ the King, who brings us joy, goodness, peace, and hope. As we embrace this story once again, let Christ be born in our hearts anew, so that when we leave, we will carry an amazing story, not of our own life, but of the life of one who gives us life, not only at Christmas, but every day of the year. Amen. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him. And without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus is the light of the world. And he came that we might also be light into the world. So as you receive your light, the Christ light tonight, I pray that you will take the light of Christ into your life and into your heart. And as we sing it will be your prayer that you will share the light of Christ and the love of Christ into the world and with all who you meet, that there may be no extra people in the world. May it be so.
when the song of angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with the flocks, then the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal those broken in spirit, to feed the hungry, to release the oppressed, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all peoples, to make a little music with the heart, and to radiate the light of Christ every day, in every way, in all that we do and all that we say. Then the work of Christmas begins. Friends, may God bless you and keep you as you take the light of Christ into the world. And may the love of God fill you so that you can fill others and the world may know peace. Amen.